Good morning. Uh, this is uh, I'm Daniel Bellin from uh, Canada Research Chair at the Johnson Suryama School, and I'm here to introduce our guest speaker, Jennifer Klein, who is a professor of history at Yale University. She earned her PhD at the University of Virginia and first came to Yale as a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Fellow in Health Policy. Professor Klein's research spans in fields of U.S. labor history, urban history, social movements, and political economy. Uh, her first book, For All These Rights, Business, Labor, and the Shaping of America's Pro uh, Public-Private Welfare State, was awarded the Ellis W. Haley Prize in Political History and Political Economy from the Organization of American Historians, and the Hagley Prize in Business History from the Business History Conference. Today, Professor Klein will discuss the findings of her brand new book, Caring for America, Home Health Workers in the Shadow of the Welfare State, which is co-authored by Eileen Boris and published by Oxford University Press. Jennifer, it's all yours. Thank you very much. And I want to say the book is a beautiful book. And uh, uh, we have actually uh, uh, here, of course, if you want to order the book or you want more information, you can pick up a copy here of this little poster after the talk. Thank you very much. Jennifer. I literally just received my copy a few days ago, so it's always kind of an astonishing moment to see it, it actually exists in reality. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I, I want to thank Danielle and, and the program, and thank you all for coming out. And uh, this is my first opportunity to be here in Western Canada. So, uh, in August of 1977, a grassroots organizing effort emerged in the South Bronx of New York among disgruntled home care attendants who had been unpaid for weeks. Still caring for their elderly or disabled clients despite no pay, they demanded restitution from the Morrisania Community Corporation, which was an anti-poverty agency turned into a vendor for the New York City Human Resources Administration. With guidance from La Raza Unida, a community organizing group, and organizer Ramon Jimenez, a core group of African-American, Afro-Caribbean, and Puerto Rican women, led by a former clerical employee, Alyssa Torres, organized a union. Nearly the entire workforce of 217 turned in union pledge cards. Now, whether the exploitation originated with the city or with the vendor, the housekeepers turned toward collective action. Together, they went to the Human Resources Administration, HRA, to complain about delayed payments, but only received, in their words, the big runaround. Women holding their ground and remaining in HRA became uh, a common sight. Not only did the workers journey there for fair hearings to recover money never received through their bureaucratic snafus, but they imp increasingly came to protest. Well, who stepped in? The Teamsters Union. And women started picketing Morrisania in October. When the, women, when the uh, Morrisania continued to forestall unionization, the housekeepers took over the corporation offices uh, on November 2nd, the night of the monthly board meeting, and addressed the full board for the first time. Quote, a lot of times because you're peaceful, they don't want to listen to you. So you have to do something in a demanding way to them so that they know that we're serious. Because we're women, don't mean that we shouldn't have rights and shouldn't fight for what we, uh, for what we think is right. And what we believe in, recounted one of the housekeepers. Fearing a general community backlash, the board voted for union certification election. Now, the more senior women actually won their election after an eight-day strike. But HRA made it clear that it would not release the additional funds for any meaningful contract. Rather than negotiate with the workers, the city terminated its contract with Morrisania in early July 1978 and reassigned the women to two Manhattan agencies. The problem was both structural and cultural. The vendor shell game inhibited social movements from winning a seat at the table and obtaining accountability. In addition, the Teamsters, a union of white, truck drivers and it had you know, dated back to the early 20th century, lacked the social movement culture, the civil rights heritage, the community connections, and the familiarity with human services um, 
that provide, you know, that proved essential to organizing women in this, the, who were still generally described as domestic workers, who weren't actually seen as workers. So used to private sector bargaining, they lacked the experience with public agencies, and they didn't understand public employment or care work. This would not, of course, ad end attempts by such workers to press collectively for recognition of the work they did, to shift it onto the solid ground of legitimacy and security that ideologically was supposed to accompany wage work in America. Neither direct public employment nor private service combining aspects of health care and household labor, home care existed in the shadows of the welfare state. While well, home attendants and, uh, and aides perform the intimate tasks of daily life. They help people get out of bed. They do bathing, brushing teeth, dressing, cooking, and cleaning. The work that enables the aged, the disabled, or the chronically ill to live decent lives at home. These workers are America's essential uh, frontline caregivers, but they earn hourly wages lower than that of all other jobs in healthcare and historically have labored without security of employment, social benefits, or even workers' compensation, which is in the case of injury on the job. Indeed, they don't even have the legal status of employees. They labor in private spaces meeting individual and family needs. But how they do so is a story of political economy, one that reflects the major changes and major shifts in welfare and the economy that define contemporary United States. Home care aides make up a vast workforce of almost 2 million workers. So this is far larger than, say, the iconic um, steel industry or auto industry that remains so valorized. It's a workforce that links our most challenging social issues an aging society, the enormous medical sector and its ability to prolong life, the neoliberal restructuring of public services, immigration, disability rights, the prospects of health care for all, and the potential of a new American labor movement. Home care is among the fastest growing occupations in the nation, adding hundreds of thousands of jobs at a steady clip. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics projected rapid employment growth in home health aid jobs, even at the start of the Great Recession, and that in, then that in fact has continued through the recession. This is second only to the growth rate for registered nurses. So these low-wage workers, though, I think also stand at the center of a new care work economy, defined by a continuum of jobs, hospital workers, nursing home aides, um, child care workers, teachers' aides, preschool teachers, school lunchroom aides, mental health and substance abuse counselors, social and human services um, assistants and specialists, and occupational therapists. These jobs are also uh, important because they cannot be offshored. They're not going anywhere. Wherever capital may migrate globally to produce goods or technical services, care work stays at home. And as has been the case with manufacturing a century earlier, waves of new immigrants continually replenish these jobs. So consequently, women's labors, which were once considered outside the market or peripheral to economic life, have now become strategic sites for workers' struggle and the direction and character of the American labor movement. And just about the only growth in the US labor movement has been in healthcare, public employment, food service and hotels, education, and domestic labors. These workers transformed organizing strategy, union demands, and the very nature of collective bargaining. Home care actually became a pivotal sector in which unions experimented with new tactics. Since the jobs stood outside of New Deal labor laws, unionization had to take part, um, you know, had to take shape apart from that framework. They also had to account for the complex interpersonal relations essential to care work. They had to enter into alliances with the receivers of care, who often have labeled themselves consumers, which has its advantage, you know, but also um, has, it can be a problematic language. And even though they labored in private homes, they had no standing of employees. And yet what they did was they turned the public welfare state into a terrain of social struggle. 
by 2010, over 400,000 workers had been, had, of these workers had joined unions. Although over the last year, their union and bargaining rights have been jeopardized by the conservative governors who took over state houses in the Republican sweep in 2010. So this project of this book has been to rethink the history of the American welfare state from the perspective of care work. Social policies are not just interim income transfer programs. They also depend on a particular configuration of labor that facilitates support on a daily basis. Government has had a central role in creating the labor market in human and social services. Government, and so what happened was broad trends in US social policy over the last half of the 20th century fostered the creation of new occupations funded by the state and actively channeled particular workers into these jobs, especially poor and minority women, deploying and perpetuating gender and racial inequality. So we're interested in this question of how the state itself could create a particular low-wage labor market that was racialized and gendered. And the beneficiaries of the service, the structure of the industry, the terms and conditions of the labor were all products of state intervention, while Americans continued to think of these as private matters. So home care existed in this netherworld between public and private, family care and employment. And it was possible because of the devaluation of women's work and the stigmatization, stigmatization attached to the labor of poor women of color. The labor, however, is not just devalued because of its ascribed racial and gender meanings, but because of the way that the state chooses to structure it. This outcome we show is historical rather than epiphenomenal. The devaluation, not only structural and ideological, but a product of the conflict and accommodation between experts, state authorities, workers, care receivers, since, and institutions since the New Deal. Now for decades, as the American population, like that of Western Europe, Canada has aged, um, baby boomers have moved towards retirement, but the US Congress has failed to enact any genuine long-term care policy. And so in the absence of social insurance, the de default has been to use public assistance and Medicaid. And so in our book, Caring for America, we're primarily discussing services funded through various public programs. But they're not unconnected to the allegedly private market, wherein middle class families have to purchase care for their loved ones. The US reliance primarily on means tested social services available only to the poor people, poorest people, has fundamentally shaped the entire labor market for care. The claim of the US Supreme Court in 2007 in sustaining the exclusion of home care workers from the nation's primary wage and hour law exemplifies the fear that only through cheap labor can we provide long-term care. It's an assumption of a zero-sum trade-off, that there has to be cheap labor if people are to have widely accessible care. And the assumption that it's this zero-sum trade-off further implies that denial and self-sacrifice are essential to, uh, to some genuine ethic of care. Our book argues that we have, um, we have a stake, we all have a stake in rethinking that assumption. Separating better care from better jobs and working conditions has moved us no further toward a viable and decent long-term care program. It turns out the devaluation of one has only perpetuated the devaluation of the other. So origins. Well, home care emerged as a distinct occupation in the crisis of the Great Depression of the 1930s, both from welfare to meet welfare and health imperatives. One strand took shape as work relief for unemployed black women who previously had labored in domestic service. During the New Deal, the state funding began to play a significant role in formulating an occupation that helped poor families and individuals who had medical emergencies or chronic illness, um, uh, or in the case of old age, while curtailing the cost of institutionalization. So state and local governments, so if there was a woman, for example, who had young children and she was in the hospital or um, somehow unable to take care of her children, the state would send substitute mothers, as it was put, into the home 
The state then would support one group of needy Americans, women with children, through employing another needy group, poor unemployed women. Government employed homemakers, as they were called, directly through the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. This was a public works program. Um, relieving public hospitals of long-term elderly and chronically ill patients became the other origin of state-supported home care. The WPA initiated a program to move such people out of the hospital and give them the necessary assistance to become, quote, independent at home. These programs often call the workers housekeepers to reflect the non-medical designation of service workers in hospital settings. But in either case, the origin of the location, or the origin was, um, or the location um, of the program, the fact was that this was assistance to the poor. Not only the workers, but the clients. Because you only obtained eligibility for the program or for the service from the Department of Welfare. So even if you were being moved out of the hospital, the Department of Welfare did a social service wet workup. Um, and so it, it basically was a program for indigents. One had to be destitute. Now, a murky line separated the housekeeper from the domestic servant. And whether working as a homemaker or a housekeeper for children or the aged, the worker cleaned, cooked, laundered, helped with bathing and dressing, and provided sympathy and comfort. She was not a nurse, but social workers in the US Children's Bureau and its network of family agencies also hoped that she would be more than a maid. The workforce resembled that of domestic service, middle-aged African-American women, most of whom were or had been married, and supported family members. Over the next half century, long after the WPA had ended, similar women would move in and out of home care, hospital, and nursing home work, private household labor, and public assistance. Haunting the job was the legacy of slavery and segregation that racialized the labor, as social workers defined it as work fit for black women. When the New Deal or when public agencies targeted you know, these jobs, they looked at black women as the people ready to do it. Now, while these 1930s public works programs created paid caregiving positions, <laughs> New Deal labor law ignored the resulting workforce. When the Democratic Congress passed old age insurance, unemployment benefits, collective bargaining, minimum wages, and maximum hour limits in the 1930s, it excluded nurse companions, homemakers, and other in-home care workers from coverage of all these new rights of employment. The exclusion of domestic workers um, from from, uh, from these laws, on the one hand, reflected uh, the political concessions, particularly to the, the southern wing of the Democratic Party, which didn't want any of this to threaten what they perceived as their control over African-American labor in the South. But also it reflected the persistent assumption that those who labored at home were not real workers. The home was not a place of waged labor. So the New Deal left a threefold legacy which persisted through the rest of the century. Although tied to the medical sector, the state would pay for home-based care through welfare agencies. Second, policy experts and welfare administrators saw female public assistance recipients as a ready, a ready labor supply for home care. And third, the exclusion of home attendance from national wages and hours laws would remain in place for the next seven decades, in fact, up to the present moment. After World War II, the network of welfare professionals around the US Children's Bureau, a federal agency, eagerly sought to define a new occupation, a job that took place in homes but performed the public work of the welfare state. The service grew through demonstration projects, through private charities um, that were receiving social security child welfare grants and assistance to the, to the agent. And they set up these training programs um, through departments of welfare. And, and of course, the training programs um, were training African-American women in domestic tasks. This was the idea of job training that was going to lift people out of poverty, was to teach them how to do laundry and cooking and take care of people, um, as if you know, these weren't the jobs that they had been doing previously. So, Yet, yeah, they had this model in mind that this would be public employment. 
And so the Children's Bureau wanted to see these workers employed through public agencies as real employees, and they saw it as a good job for mature women. That was the term they used. Women who would gain skills by taking care of their own family. So in key places like New York City, or Cleveland, um, or Washington, D.C., even North Carolina, homemakers actually became directly employed by a public agency, which meant you know, regular hours and real work. So from the 1940s through the 1960s, social workers and welfare advocates transformed a program that was originally meant for children through these kind of patchwork means and backdoor channels into a long-term care system. But the fact that it took place as a welfare service would have ramifications well into the future. Policymakers, consumers, workers, and the American labor movement. Because in the years after World War II, the major expansions of the US welfare state occurred through the Hill-Burton Act, which funneled money into hospital development, and through the growth of social security pensions, social insurance. So advocates for home care never had access to those more generous components of the American welfare state. Uh, they only had access to the lesser titles of the Social Security Act, those set up for child welfare, adult categorical aid, like um, aid to the blind, um, aid to the disabled, and the aged who were poor. Uh, so part of the reason they didn't have access to this was because of the women themselves, their actual location within the state. They don't, they're not able to tap into that. Part of it has to do with the labor, which I'm going to explain later. But so although home-based care would eventually become crucial to the medical system, these programs stayed within the realm of welfare policy. Now, after World War II, what was also happening on a different kind of track was the development of what Eileen Flores and I call a medical model. So this was this, what I just talked about was the social welfare model of home care, but there was also a medical model taking shape. After World War II, much greater resources were flowing from the federal government into the hospital medical sector. The rapidly expanding post-war medical system sought its own strategies for dealing with the chronically ill and disabled persons. So with the passage of the Hill-Burton Hospital Construction Act, hospitals received this massive injection of federal government investment, expanding the entire medical infrastructure from medical and nursing schools to hospitals to outpatient um, facilities and skilled nursing facilities, high-tech services, and you know, came to define better care, um, promising these kind of miraculous cures. So hospitals now wanted to define themselves as the leading producers and promoters of medical technology and exciting research challenges in medicine so the chronically ill and the elderly patients didn't exactly fit the elan of this you know, post-war challenge of technological um, medicine and hospital care. Post-war hospitals had decided they wanted to concentrate on acute care. And so they wanted patients who were as curable as possible. Home care offered this possible remedy for problems of overcrowding and for patient priority driven by budget concerns. Voluntary and public hospitals sought a way to rid themselves of the cost of chronically ill, often impoverished patients who were not paying, who were not covered by the growing private insurance system, uh, without abandoning them. So home care, as they saw it, would become one element in this far-reaching medical institutional complex that would extend outward from the hospital. So the program of medical home care aimed to kind of um, remove it from the domain of welfare and charity and situate it in the medical world. As an administrator of one of the key hospitals said, quote, to extend the hospital's facilities into the community and take the home under its wing. And it's interesting because there is all, uh, all this kind of paternalistic and, and gendered language in their programs as much as they um, talk about scientific care being brought into the home. But in discussing home care, the Hospital Council of Greater New York deployed a set of rhetorical constructions centered on selection, supervision, continuity of care, and integration of hospital and home care. These carefully crafted arguments justified the removal of poor people from hospitals 
while at the same time expanding the realm of medical authority. Hospitals didn't want to appear that, as though they were just callously tossing poor people out onto the street um, or neglecting their duty. And so the commissioner of hospitals repeatedly stressed that can candidates for home care were, quote, carefully selected based on medical diagnoses by physicians who would then prescribe home care as a course of treatment. Continuity care arguments enabled hospital administrators to relocate the patient's body without ceding authority um, and reassign bed space within the hospital. Indeed, they invoked hospital, I mean, they invoked continuity of care whenever social welfare authorities asserted competing claims over indigent clients and their home care. Still, eligibility for home care went to patients who were on the wards, which meant that they were poor or low income. Although not exclusively a program for the aged, many were elderly, the majority were women who lived longer but suffered from more chronic ailments than men. Um, to take New York as an example, although we discussed four different case studies in the book, over a quarter of them were on public assistance and the rest lived meagerly on social security um, uh, pensions and help from family. And in this respect, New York was squarely within national trends. Now, the medical model also promoted this notion of teamwork, that there was teamwork as part of home care. So the fledgling hospital programs asserted that home care depended on this cooperative interaction between physicians, nurses, various kinds of therapists, um, sometimes medical social workers and vocational rehabilitation counselors. But much to the chagrin of the Women's Welfare Network, the hospital social worker just hired, quote, any individual she deemed suitable to perform housekeeping duties, including relatives and friends. Neighbors, they thought, would just take up the slack. And this is literally what's actually in the reports uh, of, of these agencies. So whereas welfare administrators repeatedly stress the professional character and training of public homemakers, hospital programs presume just the opposite. Marginalized as those who would simply provide domestic labor rather than care, hospitals omitted these workers from the team. So they were most definitely not on the team. Like other forms of domestic work, the oversight groups of the hospital council treated this labor as informal, voluntary, and open-ended. For the hospital council, care referred to nursing and doctor's work. Now, the other thing that emerged at this moment, too, um, were the uses of arguments about dependence, independence, and rehabilitation. So as, as agencies and policymakers look to keep the elderly and the um, uh, disabled out of institutions and at home, they would argue, well, if we can move them into homes, they will become less dependent on the state. They will gain independence living at home. And if somebody comes in to take care of them, it will rehabilitate them. At the same time, they looked at women who are on public assistance and said, oh, well, if we can move them off of public assistance and push them into wage work, it will end their dependence on the state. They will become independent. And if we have them take care of other people, it will rehabilitate them because they'll learn how to be good caretakers. Of course, you know, there's two problems here. <laughs> well, there's probably more than that. But one key problem, the jobs still are not within minimum wage, right? So they're going to move them into jobs that don't pay a subsistence living. Um, and secondly, policymakers never shook their faith that poor women of color would be rehabilitated through new jobs in domestic labor. That remains in place through every decade of policymaking. In fact, the war on poverty comes along in the 1960s. This provided new vehicles for the state to expand the home care labor market. Once again, this time under the umbrella of anti-poverty policy, the state set the terms that maintained a racialized gendered occupation. The new Office of Economic Opportunity, OEO, um, was created in 1964. And then it created programs that gave grants to local agencies um, to do these programs, but it also created programs like New Careers for welfare recipients to meet the labor shortage in service occupations, especially health and child um, aids, home attendance, homemaker aids, 
programs classified by the U.S. Department of Labor as similar to domestic service and therefore outside of minimum wage, maximum hours, and the overtime comp of Fair Labor Standards Act. So, um, so new careers had this potential theoretically, as developed by these sociologists, um, you know, that there would be these uh, job ladders and they would move up the job ladders. But for those who were directed into jobs associated with domestic work or family care, the new career turned out to be a lot like the old one. Well, in the name of rehabilitation and ending dependency, poor women would enter the service sector at the bottom rungs as if they hadn't been there before. The specter of servile labor still hung over the job. Now, great society programs, the, those are the programs of um, President Lyndon Johnson, for the elderly also solidified the dependence on low-wage labor. The Older Americans Act of 1965, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, Medicare, which was created in 1965, which was social insurance, providing hospital care for the elderly, was aimed at those who needed skilled medical care. So Medicaid, which was the public assistance program that accompanied it, became the primary funding source for long-term care. That is, long-term care ended up, again, on the welfare side of the equation. So this outcome thrust recipients, family members, and care workers into a persistent battle against the stigmatization and insecurity of welfare. The other thing that happened is, can I move around? I was told I couldn't walk around. Uh, yeah, I have this urge to walk, but <laughs> apparently I'm fixed in place. So uh, uh, both programs set in motion this important reorganization of home and community-based long-term care. Because whether under Medicare or Medicaid, um, only a new entity, the licensed home care agency or the licensed home health agency, which hadn't existed before, only this new entity could deliver in-home services. And to be certified as a Medicare or Medicaid provider, the home health agency had to have skilled nurses and therapists on staff for acute medically related care. The significant boom in the labor demand, however, was for custodial and daily support for the workers whose labors enabled people to remain at home. And indeed, their numbers quadrupled between 1966 and 1972. But because of Medicare and Medicaid's medical model and medical definitions, certified home health agencies treated attendants as contingent and casual workers, called up on short notice for a few hours or for overnight work, often not deployed for days at a time, and, but this, first of all, the separation of, of personal care from housekeeping in actual reality, in real practice, proved extremely difficult to apply. But the predominance of this medical model, among other things, resulted in the increased casualization of the labor. So although Medicare and Medicaid fueled the rapid growth of these vast new labor markets, millions of jobs in hospitals, nursing homes, community health centers, licensed home health agencies, they pushed the home-based workers to the margins of the welfare state. Those who had been actually gaining jobs um, in the public sector through you know, public work in the 60s were now casualized and pushed to the side. Um, yet with every anti-poverty program that channeled particular poor women into home care jobs, Congress, Congress continually deferred the inclusion of them into the labor law. During the 1960s, agricultural, nursing home, and many retail workers were included in federal wage and hour law um, as the Fair Labor Standards Act was amended. But most in Congress could not accept home care as work on a par with other paid employment, being a mixture of housekeeping and bodily care. The job consisted of tasks that was expected of unpaid wives, daughters, and mothers. In 1974, Congress finally included private household workers in the wage and hour law in one of the largest legislative expansions of FLSA. Nursing home workers were also included for overtime pay. But, I'm not sure this comes as a surprise, at this very moment of triumph, a critical civil rights gain for women of color, those doing the same care work in individual homes were left out. A definitional ruse 
reduce the home aid to an elder companion. The Senate Committee on Labor and Public Welfare explicitly refused to, quote, include within the terms domestic service such activities as babysitting and acting as a companion. Well, the term companion or sitter implied friendly visitors, not women who labored to support themselves or to labor or to support their families. It also implied not really doing work. You know, you're a companion and you're sitting there keeping people company. So when the Department of Labor promulgated the rules for the implementation of the Fair Labor Standards Act amendments in 1975, it codified this previously non-existent companionship exemption, which is basically what we have now. Um, so Congress remedied one injustice but generated a new inequality by explicitly admitting those newly termed as elder companions. The rule freed staffing agencies from paying minimum wages and overtime. Well, the reclassification of home care workers in the mid-1970s occurred just as the demand for long-term care began to explode, with senior citizens and a disability rights movement calling for community and home-based alternatives to institutionalization in the face of horrifying nursing home ex scandals that were exposed in the late 70s. Um, after 1976, the home health care sector entered a phase of significant growth that is as yet unabated, and states turned aides into more casualized workers. Conveniently, it, was, I mean, it, was, it became a real growth industry at this moment. Also, with changes to Medicare and Medicaid and other government programs, especially after 1980, which deregulated it and allowed the entry of for-profit players into the market, um, you really got the emergence of a new for-profit sector. After, after 1980, across the board, proprietary for-profit agencies increasingly delivered home health services. For-profit agencies jumped tenfold in the first half of the 1980s, capturing 30% of the market by 1986. So using the model of the temporary labor agency, the ambiguous status of the home as a workplace, and the distrust of care labor as real work, home care agencies have tenaciously held on to this companionship exemption. A worker employed by these agencies not only found herself underpaid, but it was difficult to even get enough hours to add up to a subsistence income. Um, this also meant the clients themselves didn't get enough hours of service. And I'll get to a moment um, how, they, how the alliances work on that. But, so if, a time, if an assigned task did not get completed in the time allotted, the worker received no overtime pay, or perhaps no time at all. Because these become tailorized um, tasks where the state will say, okay, you get half an hour to give somebody a bath, you know, half an hour to get them out of bed. This what, well, what if a person wakes up in pain that morning? And it takes an hour to get them out of bed. And it takes an hour to get them a bath. Um, you know, the worker's not going to get paid for that uh, if she goes beyond the determination. So the determination that home care would be low-paid, low-cost labor somehow reassured governments that herein lay the answer to several welfare problems, overcrowding in public hospitals, rising cost of nursing homes, an aging population, and public refusal to spend tax dollars on welfare. The two soon-to-be dominant forms of delivery emerged to, uh, in the 1970s. Independent contractor, the worker that is referred to as an independent contractor, and the private vendor. Local and state governments turned to contracting home care through private agencies um, and designating workers as independent contractors without benefits or security. So by distancing such workers from public employment, states denied responsibility for the working conditions of an occupation whose contours government policies had done so much to set during the previous quarter century. So, now I wanted to shift to um, the contestation of the list. Because, of course, they couldn't set this alone. I mean, there were all these groups um, struggling over this, and there was contestation of this. Um, and, and so I'm gonna focus on the formal, um, uh, the attempts to form, use the formal labor movement to organize today, although we look at different kinds of movements in the book, and as I said, different states. But 
even as the welfare state location of the labor devalued the workforce. It opened up a new site of social and political struggle. So the story I want to tell now is how the women did gain a measure of political and economic power in spite of these enormous structural, ideological, and political obstacles. Um, the story is a complicated one, especially since they had to deal with this ever-shifting, evolving welfare state. Structurally, unions had to deal with the reality that the jobs were so dispersed. While there were tens of thousands of workers in, an, in a given city or state, there was no common work site. Most workers never saw each other. Many had little sense that there were so many others out there doing the same kind of work. Further, the labor itself is different from other kinds of, of work. The actual labor process is relational, creating inter interdependence. Such work consists of more than tasks completed. It doesn't produce something that can be quantitatively measured or easily represented in GNP. Essential to the job is emotional labor, affection, and trust, building up that trust. Workers cannot simply go on strike and leave clients who are unable to get out of bed. And after spending many weeks or many hours, weeks, even years with a client, the job may suddenly end with the death of the person cared for. So part of these workers' struggle involves establishing the legitimacy of care itself in a way that defies our most taken for granted definitions of work as production. And politically, unions face the additional challenge of how do you build a labor movement of poor people in a service heavily dependent on state funding, state funding that it itself is questioned. The emergence of this movement coincided with President Reagan's cuts to social service, welfare, urban policy, tax policy, and Medicaid. So many things shifted at, at once. Um, and women got squeezed as both clients and workers of the welfare state. Um, so first I want to just talk about Chicago, Illinois, as a, as a case where I think um, it powerfully illustrates the tangle of public and private forces, which home care organizing was up against, and how they came out of the shadows to fight back. We, in the book, we talk about New York, Illinois, California, and Oregon, a little bit on North Carolina. Anyway, in the mid-1970s, Illinois took advantage of federal money. It developed community care for the elderly and initially ran these programs out of public welfare. In 1979, Illinois established two programs to pay for home care through general revenues. The Illinois Department of Aging started a community care program which contracted a wide range of nonprofit and proprietary agencies to offer homemaker and housekeeping services to those over the age of 60. So workers were employees of vendor agencies rather than on the state. Now, in a separate program for the disabled, uh, through the Department of Rehabilitative Services, which I'll call DOORS, which was funded in a good part by Medicaid, they had a different model. So even within one state, they're dealing with these, these structural contradictions. In the DOORS model for disabled people, clients hired their own provider in keeping with the um, independence ethos of the disability rights movement. So this could be family or friends, and the state claimed to be the co-employer. It set the wages for the most part, um, and for most of the decade, that was minimum wage. Workers had no hospital or medical insurance, no paid vacation, no compensated sick days, life insurance, comp spent for travel time, you name it. Um, uh, they were often on long buses and subway rides to do this and, and no compensation. Well, ACORN. Um, Association of Community Organized for Reform now. ACORN came to town uh, to change all of this in 1983. Planting a branch of its United Labor Unions, ULU, key ACORN leaders had come out of the welfare rights movement of the 1960s and 70s. And like other radicals of the period, they had a sectoral analysis that linked low-wage workers with those on public assistance, including poor single mothers. So the ACORN model tied together workplace issues, such as wages and working conditions, with community ones, struggles over housing, banking, living wage campaigns. So unionization, in their view, was one part of a broader mobilization against poverty. ULU, which would become SEIU, Service Employees International Union, Local 880, used direct action and political lobbying 
with agency by agency bargaining. It built powers by recruiting members from door to door canvassing. So this is different, right, than unionizing on a shop floor where you're aimed at workers who all work in the same place. They went to public housing projects, basically. They went to churches. Um, they went to bus stops. That's where they went to find workers. They used house meetings. They developed leaders for particular actions. From the get-go, it mobilized members for electoral campaigns to gain access to political power, registering poor people to vote, getting them involved in politics. It would, quote, build an organization first that could maintain itself during workplace campaigns that could take years. Um, rather than wait for, you know, in the United States, there actually pretty much is very little um, right to organize left, and employers can subvert unionization, you know, on the way to an election. So the attitude of, of ACORN here in 880 was, you build your organization. Um, uh, and they had people pay dues, you know, and commit a loyalty to the organization. And for people who made little, that was a significant commitment. Now, with a cadre of, say, 15 to 20 workers initially, out of a total workforce of 225, the union made itself dramatically known in October of 1983 at National Home Care Systems, a domestic temp agency that, believe it or not, was formerly named McMaid um, and now had turned itself into a home care provision agency. Uh, they walked in, the organizing committee, led by Irma Sherman and, uh, and uh, Doris Gould and Juanita Hill. They showed up on payday, which was the only time workers would actually be in one place. And they stood up and did testimonials of mistreatment and disrespect. And they chanted, we're fired up, singing and demanding a meeting with the boss. When the executive director came out, Sherman announced, Here's our union, we're local 880, and asked him to sign a recognition agreement. Uh, those of you who know how collective bargaining works, this isn't it. <laughs> so she said, this is, you know, ask them to sign a recognition agreement. He declined, he called the police, um, and he retreated into his office amid louder chants. Their union, though, had become public, and the workers had made their point. This was the first of many recogn recognition actions. By the 1980s, just to step back, the National Labor Relations Board, which oversees um, uh, industrial relations in the US, had essentially become dysfunctional, as management had perfected ways to contest every aspect of the organizing process and undermine union elections and stall bargaining. So 880's collective self-assertion of the union served as an adaptive strategy to deal with the limitations of the NLRB regime. As the lead organizer, Keith Kelleher, explained, quote, we didn't wait for an employer to recognize us, but force the employer to deal with us without official recognition. So the union members made it a union, not the state. And since they were treated as not real workers within the framework of the nation's labor laws, these women had to come up with a different set of tactics for unionism in a sector that linked public and private. Um, so, at national home care systems, they actually surprisingly won an election quite quickly. But then it was the contract bargaining that turned into trench warfare and led them to these new tactics. Um, they began showing up, for example, at the owner's posh estate in the suburbs um, uh, where he had an uh, eight-car garage and swimming pools and, and horse stables. Workers turned their relationship with the consumers and the state to their advantage. They raised the specter that their clients would transfer to another agency, which in the care work sector could have the same effect as a strike. It didn't leave the clients stranded, but it stopped labor for the agency. Um, the union even then gambled on an actual strike, which required the State Department of agency, Aging to respond to the company. And that's what forced them to finally make a deal, sign a contract, um, and settle. And Local 880 won the union shop, paid holidays and vacations, a grievance procedure, health and safety protective clause, I mean, things that other workers in the US had won decades before, but interestingly also won what was really important to them, a quote, dignity and respect clause. Another thing that they won was that when the state, um, if the state raised the home care rate, that it would reopen the contract 
so that wages could be passed through to the workers, that this wouldn't actually become a lid um, on, on the workers' wages. So, um, but they also needed the political clout to pull this off because bargaining with agencies in this sector was never enough. And so they merged into the Service Employees International Union, which represented public sector workers, and began to focus on engaging with the state house. This meant not only you know, being part of elections, but taking workers up to the state house for lobbying days, um, meeting with the governor, meeting with state reps. They also gained a seat on, uh, on a on an, um, policy aging task force that they helped create. And then they brought their vendors also onto the task force. And eventually the you know, national home care system realized, oh, we have the same set of interests. Uh, in that sense. Still, Local 880 and ACORN ran up against this public-private conundrum that shaped home care employment because vendors would claim that the state was the employer um, or the co-employer, and the state would argue that the vendors were the employer or the responsible party. And so there was always this ambiguity of, of who's actually it, who are you negotiating with, who's employing. Um, and this was a problem of the Fair Labor Standards Act companionship exemption, which was constantly waved in their face. The legal structure made it very difficult to organize collectively or win economic gains. Um, and the fact is, is that thousands of, of home care workers in Chicago didn't work for the vendor agencies. They worked for the Department of Rehabilitative Services, DOORS clients, as independent providers. And so the union encountered this obfuscation of, so who's the employer? In that case, there is a union, but who would the union actually bargain with? Um, and uh, so the union proceeded with its organizing project anyway. The workers became part of fabric of the union. They participated in membership meetings, fundraising, canvassing, all of that. The state refused to formally recognize them, and yet they built up such a base of power that they were actually able to push for wage increases. They were actually able to win benefits because they just forced the political players to sit down at the table with them and won things like a meet and confer agreement in 1990s, which gave them an institutional foothold within the state. Now, based on their caring relationships, workers also acted politically with the consumers as disability rights activists referred to themselves. Their fates were linked um, through the question of hours of service. And in the economic downturn of the early 1990s, Illinois cut services to the elderly and doors by refusing new applicants. So ADAPT, which was a militant independent living group, launched confrontational protests in Chicago. <coughs> Disability rights activists brought suit with the result that federal court you know, denied um, the state or prohibited the state from denying people these benefits and stopped the cuts. So they became an alliance, um, although it would certainly, it needed to be built. It wasn't automatic, and I can talk about that um, through questions. But home care workers would defend these entitlements, um, again, by being part of this arena of struggle in which workers refused to play their role by providing care on the cheap um, and by seeing the state as, as what linked them. Workers also, through the union, were able to organize for fair hearings so the people got their benefits terminated or were cut off, they would come in with people um, for fair hearings. So for another decade, workers paid their dues, attended meetings, built the union, and finally through enough ground support for the Democratic gubernatorial candidate in 2004, a labor supportive governor came into office and through executive order formally recognized SEIU Local 880 as the collective bargaining agent for these workers. And within months, the state legislature codified his executive order into law, representing one of the largest formal extensions of labor rights in decades. So in this sense, they had changed the landscape of political power. Now, quickly, I just wanted to talk about California because I realize you know, I'm getting to the end here. But the problem of the independent provider really stymied unionization in other states, most notably California. In 1973, it was the independent living activists um, that movement that had won a new in-home support services program, IHSS, which gave them the right to hire and fire individual attendants. 
And so most IHSS aides became independent providers in California. But since the state paid for the service, home care aides existed in this legal limbo. Um, and again, it was unclear where to turn. And for a while, there was litigation over this. But the litigation always split. Some judges would say, yes, uh, the state determines the wage and sets the terms, so therefore it's the employer. And other judges would say, no, the client hires and fires, therefore it, the client is the employer. So they finally had to go a political route. Um, and they were going to have to work with consumers to win legislation. And so again, SEIU realized they had to step outside of the typical adversarial stance that, home, that because home care relied on this unique relationship, as they put it, between the home care worker and, quote, the boss, the home care consumer. And some militant disability activists remained skeptical, charging that unions saw attendant services as a lucrative area in which to organize previously unorganized workers. And they feared that um, concern for wages and working conditions would inhibit their ability to control their own care, because that was what defined independence to them. Um, it was a question of autonomy and control. So to forge a successful alliance with independent living adherents, um, SEIU gave up the right to strike, accepted consumer direction of workers, and helping along the coalition was a common enemy. The politicians from both parties used IHSS as an easy target during yearly battles over the state budget. Again, it was welfare, not an entitlement. So in the 1990s, a coalition of these groups gained enough political leverage to win an institutional means to enable unionism and collective bargaining, a public authority. At the county level, a newly created public authority would set the IHSS wage for home care providers and provide a central registry to locate the home care workforce. And so the public, the public authority would function as this employer with which to bargain. And it also would have consumer representation on it. And so it would have their input and direction. So what it did was it created a new apparatus within the state, a new institutional entity within the state to make this possible. And this settlement opened a way to county by county organizing um, with su most success in the Bay Area. And quickly, I'll just say, in the Bay Area, I think what made it so successful was not just that you had a long-standing union, but it was strong in the healthcare sector among hospital workers and other healthcare workers. And so they brought home care workers in as medical workers. They saw them as part of a spectrum of um, a basically an aggressive for-profit medical system. And, and so in the Bay Area, um, uh, after winning the public authority, winning a union election, um, continuous improvement in wages and benefits, they won the highest wages for home care workers in the state and actually probably in the nation. And so from that, we realized that um, uh, um, by understanding, first of all, the historical hybridity of home care as an occupation, it had led to competing union strategies. Um, and that by the end of the 20th century, there were two different care worker union movements, a welfare state unionism with a core political strategy reliant on creating density within the long-term care sector, and a health care unionism, which contested medical institutions within an aggressive for-profit industry um, that perpetually sought to reduce costs by offloading more work into the home or civil similarly marginalized spaces. And home care workers inhabited the lowest rungs of that medical hierarchy. So for hospital workers, organizing them became essential to countering the outsourcing of their labor to the privacy of the home, a space seemingly beyond regulation and outside of labor law. And so the only way to fight for dignity and recognition was to morph homemakers and personal attendants into health workers um, and moving home care from the arena of welfare to that of health care. Well, the macroeconomic structuring then of the occupation, along with its interpersonal challenges, heightened the stresses of an already emotionally and psychologically intense and economically precarious job. Workers, family members, state administrators, policymakers all wring their hands in frustration over the undependability 
of home care services. For the former, there aren't enough hours. Uh, for the latter, there never seem to be um, reliable or trustworthy workers. Now, three months ago, President Obama actually announced that the US Department of Labor would move to overturn the companionship exemption and include these workers in the minimum wage and overtime provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Obama's proposal not only rectifies a 30-year injustice and faces the realities of our aging society in the 21st century um, and the service labor that dominates our economy, the new DOL proposal will explicitly recognize housekeeping that is integrally bound up with caregiving in the home, valuing the multi-dimensions of care work and mandate the payment of, of travel time. Um, the fact is, is the job title has changed repeatedly since the 1930s. And yet, these workers have always performed a combination of basic bodily care, bathing, dressing, feeding, and ambulation, and housekeeping. At this point, longer life expectancy means that more of us will live with chronic illness. The majority of Americans across the spectrum of class and ethnicity will at some point depend on a caretaker often one who has long labored in poverty and struggled mightily to balance her own and others' social needs. So I think we all obviously have a stake in rethinking this, and yet what's happening now is despite Obama's move, um, in the current fiscal crisis, states have used the very slipperiness of the companionship terminology to squeeze the workers and extract more unpaid labor because they are actually cutting hours and cutting services. And what are the very services they're targeting to cut? Housekeeping. The services that you know, always seem to be, you know, it wasn't clear that those were considered compensable labor or real work. So clearly undervaluing what is actually essential to care work has not, in fact, expanded what we have. So as a nation, I think we, we have, you know, assume that cheap labor um, is the only way that we can afford to provide long-term care. And we need to begin to think about the recipients along with those who do the work. The Great Recession and the Republican ascendancy are shaking the very programs that made home care services possible. Can we let these forces make life more precarious for all of us? Obviously, a majority of us will need care the absence of public support and labor standards together may hasten the day when no one will be available to care. <laughs>